Welcome to the fourth annual Guild of Music Supervisors Conference. Okay, thank you everybody. Welcome, welcome to Composing a Blockbuster, our next panel. I thought the best way to start with scoring a blockbuster is getting the job of scoring a blockbuster. And this particular journey to Jungle Book started with John getting fired from a movie. So, Oh, you had to bring that one up, <laughs> yes. didn't you? So take us back in time when you were working on the immortal classic... Long Kiss Goodnight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Starring Gina Davis? Gina Davis, yes. 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 And, very nice person. Yeah. Very, and so they changed direction and went with another composer after you had completed the score. And I've always wondered, because I said, I just get the phone call, hey, we've changed direction. And then I don't actually think, and how does that feel? Boy, what a great question. Uh, it feels terrible, actually. It, uh, and in the case of that one, the only the really good part is coming up, uh, how we turned it into a positive. But it, it was horrible. Um, it was earlier in my career, and I thought, okay, I'll never work again. And luckily, um, that wasn't the case. And it just it feels bad for a while. And you try to process it, and you try to you know, when you say we made a change of direction, that, that's always a catchphrase for we just didn't like your stuff, you're out of here, it didn't click. So it doesn't feel good, and you feel kind of like you've really failed. Um, and I guess you have if, if, if you're in that. But we all are in those positions, that's for sure. Yeah, the, the likelihood of having a sustained career as a film composer and not have a score tossed means you live in an alternate universe, or it means you never tried anything. You were so bland and banal, no one thought to throw out the music because they didn't notice it was there. So, uh, so this happened before I represented you. And one of the things when I start representing someone is I do a bit of intel to figure out who loves you and who doesn't love you and why and where are our strengths and where are the weaknesses. And so I made the rounds at all the studios and asked about John. And fortunately, with the exception of one studio, everyone was like, oh, we love John. So of course, the one I was the most interested in was the one that didn't love you, which was New Line Cinema, who made the classic movie whose title I can't remember. And- Long Kiss Goodnight. Okay. Long Kiss Goodnight. And I asked why. And it wasn't that because, oh, we really hated the music. It was the way it was handled in the, uh, Moving on. Yeah, the course of settling it up left a bad taste in their mouth. Now, what I'm so I heard a lot about the negativity of what had happened in the way it went down. Did you, as the composer, have any idea what was going on behind the scenes? No, I didn't. And, and that's that was the shame of it, as before I was with you, that there was so much um, uh, animosity and anger that was left out of that divorce that it really hurt me over there. And I had no idea about it. So that was one of the first things that Richard did. And he's brilliant. He's the best at what he does. And I always have learned to listen to him. <laughs> um, and that this was a key moment and, and, where... And, and, yeah. and every studio is different. And what I realized was New Line Cinema was a company run by a guy. And his passion gets you a job or his resentment loses you a job. So when talking to the heads of music there, I said, what could John do to get in the good graces of the head of the company. Do you have any movie you're having a problem with that he can fix? Any movie he could score for free to prove that he is a team player? And the timing was perfect. They go, oh my God, we have a movie. And it was budgeted for a synth score and a composer fee. But now this director wants to do a big traditional orchestral score and we don't have the money for it. I go, okay, here's the deal move all the money over to the orchestra, pay John nothing to score the movie, and if the movie's a success, give him some bonuses. And he went back, and that movie turned out to be Q. Elf. Yep. Wow. And, and the punchline is, 
The box office bonuses were far greater than his fee would ever have been. And it, first of all, working on a great movie in and of itself is a great thing. Absolutely. But the most important thing in this industry is not a movie. Movies come, movies go. The thing we talk about this week, we're not even going to remember next week. But what matters is relationships. And Elf happened to be directed by, next slide, John Favreau. Yep. So what was a John Favreau at the time of Elf? John Favreau at the time of Elf had just come off Swingers, and which was a, we all know Swingers, a great sort of perennial indie hit. And he was a kid in a candy store. He'd never had a, a score of, you know, any kind of size. I think Swingers was a lot of needle drops. So we, I literally, crazy thing was they sort of new line, once Richard's, Secure the job. We took a couple meetings with John. Um, he was a very, you know, newbie at this thing. And we had a couple initial discussions and we just started to work. He did want, you know, he was, he's very articulate. He's very, he's an incredibly bright guy, as you know now, obviously. And um, he did know he wanted a big orchestral score. He wanted a big sort of classic score. He, he would always say, you know, something that, they'd listen to in 50 years. So that's what I strove to do. We just started our work and he was sort of giddy the whole time. The first day of the scoring session at Tadeo with a big orchestra, he was just like, you know, jumping up and down and just having a ball. Yeah. And the result was spectacular. But another thing that's, un that's descriptive of being a film composer is you are not necessarily in a monogamous relationship with your director and your director is going to not always use you on every movie. So you've had sort of, you do some of John's movies, you don't do some of John's movies. What does, again, what does it feel like to kind of go, hey, buddy, and then you're not doing his next movie necessarily? Well, that, that's, I'm sure many of you have experienced that same feeling. It's, it's sort of like dating, dating someone, and you really click, and you feel, wow, there's really something special here. And guess what? They don't call you next week and you hear they're dating so-and-so. So it, you know, it's, but, the but is, we're all, most of you are professionals, you know, either composers or, or supervisors. You know, you really, as Richard was saying, you strive for longevity, you strive for relationships. Nine times out of 10, I found that even if they go, you know, a creative goes away from you for a while, you know, if you've had some success, and we obviously had some success, they kind of invariably come back. You know, they'll go try a different flavor. Right. As and Richard, that's why it's really yeah. important to when they say, uh, I, it's not you, but I want to see other people. It's important to go, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I wish you the best. Because life is really long, and it, it, you gain nothing by spewing your disappointment and misery. It was probably hard for them to tell you. And make it easy, because they're going to make another movie. And if you have confidence in yourself, it's likely they're going to come back. And I would just add to that. That's absolutely true. And I would add to that that you want them when they come back, because then they'll be very eager to be back with you, and they can tell you all the stories of how bad the date was, which I've gotten, by the way. And sometimes you hear through your wonderful agents, or you'll hear from musicians around town like can you believe that they so you're hoping you know you with a good heart and a big heart and sincerity as Richard said you hope they come back now part of why I was so attracted to John early was his music and his personality and uniquely to me was your background because I am I'm the number one film music geek and I also hope to hold the title of number one Disney geek and I'm obsessive about Disney. And as it turns out, when we started talking, tell us a little bit about your history. Well, you know, unbeknownst to either of us, when we first met, he did not know my history. I didn't know his love for Disney. Turns out that my dad worked for Walt Disney for 42 or three years. He was the clapper boy on Snow White at 16 years old. And I grew up as part of the Disney 
brat. I was a Disney brat. I would go to the studio and hang out with the Disneys and whoever, and I was very blessed by that. And so, strangely, that, that when we started talking about our passions, and I found out he was a big Disney person, and I told him, related the story, uh, it was amazing. It was sort of like we were meant oh, to... Oh, yeah, you were on the set of Mary Poppins. I was it's, on the set of Mary Poppins. And his I was. best friend growing up was the voice of Mowgli yes. in the Jungle Book. So it's like, right. I'm just drooling, like, tell me more. And then, I don't care what movie you ever do, the coolest thing is every attraction at Fantasyland, he did the score for it. When they did the redo in 81. That's right. That's yep. right. So next time you spin on a teacup or you cruise through It's a Small World, you are listening to him. Flash Mountain. Yeah. I've forgotten <laughs> half of them. Thank you for that. So then John Favreau has this illustrious career leading up to him making The Jungle Book which to me was so obvious. It's John Debney, your buddy, at Disney, scoring The Jungle Book. And I waited for that phone call and kept calling the music department. They go, yeah, we're working on it. And we, we, you know, the studio does want to run some other names by the director. And it's like, stop killing me. Please, just hire John. And again, going back to how do things feel, when you know they're making a movie that you really know you're right for, it's a guy you have a relationship with, and they're not just signing the wedding papers right away. Right. What does it feel like? Well, it, same, same feeling. You know, you, you develop that skin, that thick skin. And the wonderful thing about Richard and Laura and, uh, you know, is they're really passionate about it. And what I love about Richard, he'll call me with good or bad news, which a good manager does, and we talked about it. And he said, you know, buddy, and I mean, John loves you. Mitchell loves you, head of the music department at Disney. But, you know, you haven't done any bigger things for them lately. And there, there are new, uh, new executives. And they need to kind of be, you know, sort of convinced. So, it, you know, you just you sublimate it. You, you become an adult and you just go, okay. And you trust. And so I trusted in Richard. And what I came up with. And I called John, I go, I've got a crazy idea. What if you make a family scrapbook of your history at Disney and have it hardbound published and there's a CD of your music in it and there's like 40 pages of a scrapbook of your, you and your family's history of Disney? Can we, sing, can we bring it up? So that was the original cover. This is later became the promotional version when there was artwork. The original was a hardcover velvet book that looked like the kind of book at the beginning of a Disney movie. They zoom in on and then you turn the pages. And then let's go to like what some of the interior pages look like. It was like his dad's employee, you know, first of all, making this scrapbook was more fun than anything in my life. We had a ball just making the scrapbook. Yeah. yeah. And, if the, and I remember you saying, if I don't get the movie, I should own this for my coffee table anyway. And can we see another page of it? It's sort of his history of doing stuff at the at studio. And Mitchell Lieb, the head of music, took a stack of these and at the right moment to the right person said, hey, you may not know this about John. He's really passionate. And it's got a CD. Why don't you listen to his music? And then one glorious day, we got the phone call. You were on board. Yeah, there were phone calls before then. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Um, I give all due credit. Richard came up with the idea. And, you know, I, I've learned over the years that when you really trust someone and you love them, you just say yes. And I've learned with Richard over all these years, you know, I, I could have early in my, as a younger person, oh, that's a crazy idea. But I've learned that, that he's a visionary, in my opinion, and he's also one of my best friends. And so you trust. And He's usually right, you know. And so, we skip over the times I'm completely wrong. Well, there are times when he's wrong. You uh, know, it's not that often, but I like there to are times. pepper it, mix it in. Yeah, yeah. And not so, perfect. <laughs> so now, <laughs> and batting average is what counts. And now you're on Jungle Book, which yes. let's look at what that is. So you're on Jungle Book, and Jungle Book could be anything musically. Yeah. So, what were the conversations you guys had? Well, the, I remember getting the phone call, by the way. John Favreau called me, uh, called me while, while I was in a limo with my wife going, I think, to the Emmys or something a couple of years ago. 
And, you know, typical John Favreau. John Favreau's the amazing guy, not as not warm and fuzzy, but just uh, the most loyal, wonderful, solid guy you'd ever want to meet. And he just matter of factly said, So, uh, you think you want to do this with me, you know? And as he does, and I said, Are you kidding? You know? So we initially spoke about what the score would be. And what he wanted was a score, again, that was going to be a classic score, but that, that incorporated some of the original amazing music from the original. And yet he didn't want it ever to be, you know, a certain type of score. He didn't want it to be an Indian score. He wanted it to be a world score. He wanted the influences of the place and the time. But he really wanted, he would always tell me, just think if... Walt heard this right now that Walt would actually like it. Well, there's no pressure. Yeah, <laughs> which is, you know, and that's kind of the, that was kind of our mantra. And we just went from there. One of the things, if you look at the original Jungle Book, it had a score that started off a certain way, which you reference in the opening, which was really cool. It's like, ooh, we're in the old Jungle Book world. And then you snapped out of it. But Jungle Book's a musical, and this movie is a weirdly interesting, not a musical, but has musical moments in it. And so, uh, can you bring up, so among the people who you worked with were Bill Murray singing Bare Necessities, and Christopher Walken singing um, I Wanna Be Like You, and Scarlett Johansson singing Trust In Me. What was it like working on the songs, and also two of those were written by your really good friend, Richard Sherman. Well, that was one of the best parts of the, of, of the job, was that John, early on, wanted to embrace, obviously, this amazing, iconic, you know, legendary music. And one day, the, the way this all started, so we knew sort of going in, as Richard said, that, that I was going to utilize and pepper some of the original songs and themes through the movie, one day, everything kind of opened up. This incredible gift opened up. John called me, as he would, and I wouldn't hear from him for weeks at a time because they're working on this, trying to figure out how they're going to do this. So he called me one day. He goes, uh, I got a question for you. Do you, think, uh, do you think Dick Sherman would be amenable to writing another, you know, like an additional verse for Want to Be Like You? And I'm like, yeah. And knowing Dick, Dick is an old close family friend of mine and he was a very good friend of my father's you tell the story of you as a child yeah. well I, yeah very briefly uh i was an eight-year-old boy at my father's knee going to the studio very shy kid uh just starting to play guitar and learning about music a little bit and my dad one day thought it'd be a great idea to have me meet the sherman brothers and maybe the sherman brothers would let me hang out with them for a day and that's what happened. So they brought me up to their office. I don't remember what they were working on specifically, but I just remember they were so warm and they were banging, Dick was banging stuff out on the piano and Bob was yelling at him and trying to get a rhyme right. And then, fi and then f you know, f flash forward a couple, couple hours, I'm having lunch with them, not saying a word. Dick always says that, that he likes to tell people that I didn't really say much. I was just a shy kid. Fade out, fade in, spent the rest of the day with them, and then fade out 40-some-odd years later, I'm getting the call that Dick Sherman might be brought in to write an additional lyric for his masterwork. And um, Dick came in. We started working together. He started working with John. Um, I'll never, uh, just a quick story. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I was sitting with John Favreau and the editor and my music editor, and there's Dick Sherman. We're sitting together on the couch. John Favreau is explaining the film to Dick, and he's, you know, painting this picture and about this, the, you know, the allegory, what the story means, and, you know, where he wanted to take this film as opposed to the, the original. And start talking, and John Favreau was talking about King Louis. And in our new film, King Louis is a gigantolopithecus. It's it's a real ape that was, you know, a many, like, thousands, what, tens of thousands of years ago, there was a big 10-foot ape. So that's what King Louis is supposed to be. Well, Dick started writing down that name, Gigantilopith, Gigantilopithecus, he's going, wait, wait, that rhymes with, and he starts going, and, and he starts writing the lyrics right on the couch, and I, I remember... <laughs> 
I remember him and seeing this genius starting to work. I remember looking at John Favreau, and we just wanted, we, we did one of these. Yeah, and it was one of, like, you don't want to react. But. And then he came up, and, and, and literally he had the lyric within the first half hour of the meeting. Yeah, I remember him calling me from the meeting, yeah. going, it's a giant, giant, Get it's it. a it's a he goes, it rhymes with ridiculous. ridiculous. He was so happy. <laughs> it was like, it was the gift that keeps on giving. And, and, boy. and so wow. you also went out of L.A. to record. Talk about that a little. We did. We, we had a lot of adventures on the film. On the right, we were in New Orleans with uh, these guys because John wanted a really, uh, as the original film, he wanted a New Orleans jazz approach to, to want to be. And, and uh, you know, and he, he wanted the real guys. You have to go to New Orleans. I mean, the, these musicians are incredible. So we were in New Orleans with Dr. John is on the far right. And he played piano and sang. And then you've got, of course, Chris, John, and Bill. Uh, Chris and Bill are the exact opposites. Bill comes into the room and he wants to start you know, playing jokes on people and introducing. Chris Walken is a very professional, very, very, you know, very prepared guy. And Chris Walken and I had a cowbell moment. You remember the cowbell <laughs> moment? And this is the absolute truth. I was sitting in a little tiny booth with him, and I'm trying to count him in. He goes, just, uh, with due respect and love for Chris Walken, he goes, just count to four. One, two, three, four, and then I sing. And so my studio that I was at, very crude place in New Orleans, weren't so great with the Pro Tools, and they kept screwing up the clicks. So I would go, two, three, no, you got to say one. So I was trying, anyway, we got through it. There is B-roll footage. John Favreau tried to save me, and I spent about an hour with Chris Walken in this little sweaty room trying to get so it was wonderful but he did a great job he was prepared he came in and we were we were not prepared for him he was prepared well actually john we have 10 minutes thanks to that man with a piece of paper that said so for uh some incredibly insightful questions or some lame ones or anything in between we will take any kind of question starting with you What's it like to compose to those giant blobs of a character? You don't have the picture yet. You have sketches. You have CGI placeholders. T talk about that process, please. Great question. Uh, if I had not have had, and I'm not just blowing smoke. John knows of, of our love for each other. If, if I didn't, if he wasn't such a great storyteller, I would have no clue. Because initially... It was just these blobs and things moving around, as Richard said, with no, with no emotional context. Um, so initially, you know, when I was writing the first themes, I was starting with themes and writing a theme for Mowgli. And as we got going, you know, there's a stampede, so I had to do a piece of big, you know, stampeding water buffalo. So he would talk me through all of this stuff because... It was so ill-defined and ill-formed emotionally that he would, sometimes I would go in and present music to him and he'd go, that's a great piece of music, but you know, it's not really what's going on in the scene. What's going to happen is, you know, Ka's going to come out of here from nowhere and she's going to have this seductive. So he'd, he'd explain to me because it was such a new way. This is literally groundbreaking. You guys probably know this, the, the, None of this technology existed before they started. They were sort of R&Ding this as they went. So it was crucially important to have a filmmaker and a storyteller as gifted as John to really tell all of the crafts what the emotion was, what he wanted, what's going on. And it was very difficult, but luckily he, he brought us through. I mean, the most shocking credit in movie history is at the very end of this movie, it says entirely filmed in Los Angeles. It's a warehouse outside of downtown LA. In right in down right there. Yeah. Right in downtown. So it, you notice how much that looked like downtown LA. <laughs> right around the corner was the pantry. That's right. Yes. That's right. So uh, another question. This side needs a question. Don't let them beat you. You're better than them. <laughs> oh, 
See? See? See, they just pounce on this stuff. Testing one, two. Uh, Jermaine here. Uh, so I've been kind of watching you over the years, um, and I guess I've come to watch how you've incorporated, you know, uh, keeping your family close to you um, during your process of, as we talk about this, composing the blockbuster. Can you talk a little bit about how you've navigated the blockbuster level pressures and then actually having, a, which, which is very rare, it's seemingly healthy and um, family relationships with kids, longevity in marriage, things like that. Well, I've known you for a while, and I love your work, Jermaine. We, we, we go way back. Thank you for the question. You'd have to ask my wife about that. My wife, Lola, married happily for 34 years. Um, you know, it really... And I'll be actually Richard, married 37, so the yeah. happy part was 34. But I'd love, I'd love to get Richard's perspective too, honestly, because you know he has to deal with his artists and through different personal situations. But I'm just blessed, Jimmy. I'm I'm blessed to have a great wife, an incredible wife, incredible kids, incredible support group. Um, that not very big. I'm not. You know, I have we have a couple of people working with us and my. Son works with me, which, which I'm really thrilled about. But I think it's, that's a little hard to answer. It, it's an everyday uh, thing of trying to, trying to bridge work. I, I know I go into my, my caves, you know, it gets very intense, as you know. And there are days when I just, I just shut down. But I try to go into my hole for a little while and then I come back out. Or Richard will call me and go, hey, buddy, what's going on? And he kind of gets me back. Well, I also, I also think my observation is that composers tend to have three primary relationships. One is their career, one is their family, and one is their misery. And the less time you spend in relationship with doubt and worry and... What if this happens? I mean, it, it, it's a big relationship, and it can occupy not just the hour you think about it, it, the ripple effect of living in that mindset can really be a time suck. And I've noticed the composers who have the healthiest relationship with their families tend to be the ones who don't spend much time on their misery. It's like, we often say, Let's be miserable three days from now. Let's just schedule it. We'll come back to it. Anything you want to complain about, we can talk about then. But and it's like, okay, and by the time three days comes around, there's no reason to it. Yeah, and I, I, I hope we're answering the question, Jermaine, because I know you're a family guy too. Um, I think that's it. You know, there are times where you just get in this sort of, it depends on the kind of person you are too, but you get in that kind of, oh, woe is me thing. And then invariably, you know, I'll get a call from, or I'll be with my wife. You know, some cheerleader in my life will call and say exactly that. Like, okay, it's okay to feel bad for, you know, I'll let you feel bad for, you know, another day or two. But then, and it's really right. You have to then just get back up, up on the horse and keep going. But it, 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 is, it is a balancing act for sure. You know, the, the st stress of working in Hollywood for all of us it, it's it's tough. It's it's very very tough. And you for Richard for one can tell, relate any kind of stories of the successes and the failures of composers or people in music that you know took a wrong path or a right path. But I think if it's long as you are grounded somehow in your life and you have people that surround you, I think that's really essential. And again, I've I've got a great amazing support team and I, I believe me though I there are dark moments you know he doesn't see them much but my wife sees them yes. you know <laughs> thank you for shielding me yeah I feel like the child who doesn't want his parents fighting I don't want to be uh, one of those clients I told him a long time ago I never want to be one of those clients but yeah. every now and then I have to just kind of I saw a hand from this side right there the tall hand don't look over your shoulder. It's all about you. The one right behind you. Guy in T-shirt with the logo on it. Yes. <laughs> um, well, first I want to say congratulations. I saw the movie. 
really love everything. Um, I always wondered, um, how do you keep, when, when they tell you, you know, I want something from the original movie, like the, the feel, the, like get something from that. How do you keep your originality, like keeping away from that? And, you know, how do you make that balance? What's the process like? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's, I, just because I've been doing it a long time, for me personally, and I, I, would, I would say with Jungle Book, it was really a case study in that where you, you have to be, and John was very clear, you have to be very, very true to the cultural aspects of, of uh, first of all, of Kipling and, and of the people involved and the animals involved and locale involved. And you have to be, I've always felt this way whenever I've done, like I would mention Passion of the Christ or something that is a different part of the world than, than I'm from, that, that is my experience. I, I do a lot of study and, I, and I've always felt that if you're going to jump into whatever those things, those areas or those cultural things that you really need to do it right. And one of my pet peeves is when somebody does sort of a cursory, um, a, a, you know, the light version of study of, of Gregorian chant or of music from, you know, what a deduk can play, what notes it can play. You really have to get the people in the room, the, the performers, and you have to study. And sometimes, by the way, it gets rejected. I mean, I may think it's the best take on a given scene, and it happened in Jungle Book, you know, where I would go perhaps a little too ethnically correct and John would, would usually like it, but just always want it to be grounded in Disney sensibility. He would always say that. Is it, is it Disney sensibility? And that's the best way I can put it. But they're all different. All films are different. Well, we have run out of time, unfortunately. So you can tackle us in the parking lot with your questions. And thank you, John, so much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.